Okay, we're going to get started on the next series here. And I was going to call this Raw Raw Sis Boom Ball, but I changed my mind. I'm going to call this Raw the Son of God Within Man. And we're going to go over the higher aspects of the mind, at least some parts. We could keep going, uh, diving into the mind and uncovering this information. There's just layers and layers and layers. And it's um, not only within us, but it's in our environment. And it's multi-layered. It's like holographic fractal information embedded on top of each other. So literally, the, there's millions of information just related to the mind. So I'm just going over some of the basics to help you understand what's really going on. And that the focus needs to be going inward to awaken these powers within us, to awaken our God force within us, so that we can be better beings and be empowered beings. When we try to do it through the world, when we look at the world as being the problem, and we try to fix the outside, it will never be forever fixed. It will always be having to go back and redo things. But if we go within, where the real issue, where the real growth needs to happen, and we address it from there, then reality will change. Once we be the change that we want to see in the world, it will show up in the world. We can't beat the world and to conform to our ideas. It's us <laughs> that is leading that idea of what's happening in the world. And by changing our consciousness, changing our limiting beliefs, and opening our heart, then the world will change, not any other way. So it's got to be an inward journey. So again, we're going to start this new series here, Ra, the Sun God Within Us. And I've gone over the reptilian brain, and you now know that the reptilian brain represents the devil, Ganesh, and a couple of other entities. But mostly it's the devil. It's that lower part of our mind. Right here you can see me circling it, the brain stem and the cerebellum. It's this part of the brain that, we're not supposed to hate this part of the brain. The whole idea is that we balance the lower aspect of our brain, this reptilian snake devil-like aspect of our mind with the higher mind. And from the reptilian mind we go next to the limbic brain and then beyond that we go into the cortex and then the most advanced part of the brain is the prefrontal cortex and that's where the uh, forehead is, <clears throat> where the forehead is, where the third eye is. So, but the limbic brain is what bridges all the other aspects of the brain together. It's known as the bird brain which is really significant when I go into the sun god Horus or Ra um, and the sun god Horus, Ra, they were actually separate entities or separate gods but then eventually got melded into one so Ra is Horus and basically he has a falcon head, a bird head which is interesting because it is representing or like a clue that all that is related to the limbic brain. The god of Horus, the god of sun is right here in the limbic brain and we're going to really get into that in this little series. The limbic brain, okay, so let's go back, let's go back just a little bit. The reptilian brain, the devil-like brain, is the one that's in charge of our uh, autonomic uh, aspects of our body. So when our heart beats, we don't have to think about heart beating, which is good, because if you had to think every couple of seconds for your heart to beat, it's quite distracting. It takes care of your your breathing, all kind of hormonal exchanges, all these things happen without you having to think about it. They're automatic. And that's okay to a certain degree, but if we want to be empowered and take control of ourselves, we got to go up into the higher aspects of the brain. The first part of that is the limbic brain. And ultimately, you know, your uh, blood pressure and your um, how your nervous system works all can be controlled by your thought. You can slow down your blood pressure or speed it up just by thinking and focusing. So even though this lower part of the brain takes care of that function overall, it can get into patterns of negativity. So the limbic brain is where you can start taking control of those lower patterns and changing them the way you want them to be. You can actually heal your uh, blood pressure issues by dealing and focusing on the mental emotional level. So the limbic brain is the emotional brain. And here I've got this little, uh, at the top here I said, it says Limbic Brain and Star Trek Enterprise. Because you're going to see here, there are a couple of different uh, pictures that 
this part of the brain actually looks like a spaceship in a way. It looks very alien compared to the other parts of the brain. And it is the emotional bird brain. So we're, we're rising up out of the reptilian brain into the bird brain, the emotional brain. So the devil is all by instincts. It's all by survival. The limbic brain is where emotions come in. And our emotions are what can override the basic instincts of ourselves. So let's say that um, there's a caveman out there and their basic instinct is to survive. As one matures and grows, then what happens is the emotions can begin to control the lower part of the mind. So as opposed to going out there and killing just to have what you need, the emotions can override that instinct and you can live a higher, better way. The limbic system of the brain is a group of structures which govern emotional emotions and behavior. The limbic system and in particular hippocampus, which is right here on this lower picture, uh, hippocampus means seahorse, and you can see it looks very strange. And the amygdala, the amygdala is um, the part of the brain that's associated with the uh, planet Mars, and has a lot to do with allergy reaction, uh, fight or flight response, adrenal tie-in. And basically, your mind is um, can be overlaid to the astrology chart, and the different planets relate to different parts of the mind. So literally, whatever you're born with, your natal chart, you can overlay that on the brain and see how different parts of your brain relate to one another. Um, so the hippocampus in the amygdala is involved in the formation of long-term memory and is closely associated with the olfactory, which is your breathing sense. So emotions are really strongly tied into our sense of smell. Essential oils can be extremely healing and uh, bring about um, aspects of deeper healing because it's opening old memories and bringing them to the surface to be healed. Um, and they have to do, like I said, the olfactory has to do with the sense of smell. So the hippocampus is one of these structures with closely associated with the limbic system. So all that's saying right here is that our breathing, it really ties us into emotions. Um, there was, I used to watch MASH as a kid, old TV series, and I remember this one series where one of the main characters um, had smelled some moldy wet tarps and he got really really sick and then they called in the psychologist from you know from out of a, out of another base and during the t during the TV show what's revealed is that when he was a kid his brother pushed him in the water and, and he was having a hard time he's like drowning in the water and the, you know he was la him and his friends were laughing uh, or his brother and his friends were laughing at him and that embarrassment and that that emotional charge was never cleared so the smell stimulated that memory and he was getting sick from it so our sense of smell is very powerfully tied into our emotions um, so it, it pays to be a, pay attention to what you um, let your sense of smell let in the sense of smell is also your first level of defense out in the wild you can see something before you can hear it or see it in most cases. So the sense of smell, just like most animals in the world, the sense of smell is what mainly their main uh, sense for for self-preservation. So the sense of smell is very powerfully associated with our emotions. The Eye of Horus. And I'm going back to show that most of the spiritual, if not all, of the spiritual stories and um, entities, deities, are actually referring to parts of the brain. And the Eye of Horus is no different. Um, the Eye of Horus is actually repeated a couple of different times. And the Eye of Horus, remember Eye of Horus, he is the falcon-headed god. So here is an eye of a bird. And it actually fits right over the ventricles, which is a very interesting part of the brain, the ventricles here. You can see how this first ventricle has this line that goes back where you can see that right here on the eye of Horus. And then you have this eyebrow, which could be the back part of the ventricle. And then in the center here, you've even got a bird-shaped kind of head with the eye. And the eye is just a hole through that ventricle. And then a line down through that goes down through the, the brain stem. And there's a pons right here. And if you notice here on the Eye of Horus, there's always a little protrusion on one line that comes down from the eye. That protrusion, interestingly enough, if you look at the spinal cord, 
the, the pawns actually sticks out a little bit. So I really think that this is a representation of different parts of the mind. The eye of Horus, it's telling you it's related to the bird brain and it's actually how it ties into other, other aspects. This long curly a spiral would spiral back into the cerebellum which is the reptilian brain and also we know now that the spinal cord is part of the reptilian brain too. So the eye of Horus ties the lower aspect of the brain and the middle brain, the limbic brain together. And the ventricles are filled with cerebral spinal fluid and the interesting thing about water is water carries frequency and in a minute I'm going to show you something about sacred geometry. So, um, and another representation down here, I drew the Eye of Horus um, kind of in a distorted way just over aspects within the head. The eye actually relates to the thalamus and if you look here back at this top picture, this eye up here in the ventricle, this little circle in the center, there's, you have two thalamuses and they connect through that little junction. So the actual eye of Horus, however you draw it in the head, the actual eye of Horus is the thalamus, which is really interesting because based on Vedic astrology, the sun is related to the thalamus in your astrology chart. The sun is the central part of the brain where everything tends to go through. It's the central part, just like our sun is the center of our uh, solar system. Very interesting. Down here, I, I made some um, drawing, like I said, of the eye of Horus. So the cerebellum still relates to the spiral, the spinal cord, the pons, the part coming straight down from the eye. The thalamus is the eye. In this picture down here, the pituitary is like the frontier duct, and the pineal gland is the back part of the eye. And down in this picture, the upper eyebrow is the corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum is what connects the left and right uh, hemispheres of the brain. It's a bunch of nerve fibers. And I'm going to show you here in a second, but basically the corpus callosum are the wings that are on top of the medical staff. It's the basic wings that you see on the medical staff where you have the two snakes intertwining going up and then you have the wings spread out. That's basically showing you the chakra system overlaid on the endocrine system and the wings spread out are, is the corpus callosum, which is really amazing to me. Again, another representation um, tying into the body. Here's another picture, kind of a 3D picture of the limbic brain. You can see how this looks like some kind of spaceship. <laughs> and ultimately, when we can control our emotions, which tie into the hypothalamus, which is the sub-aspect of the thalamus, we basically can steer our water in our body and tune into different uh, realities, basically, at the apex of what we can do. Until we fully, fully develop that, we can just tune into our emotions and have different hormones cascade, which cause a different to cause us to be different in certain circumstances. So when we can control our emotions, when we can control our water, we can then tune into how we want to experience something and not have it control us ultimately. And, but I think it's really interesting how this looks like a some kind of spaceship, like a Cleon ship right here. Um, and that's, that's right there, central part of the brain. You can see here the cerebellum, the greenish color, is actually the lower brain, and then this, this is the midbrain, reptilian brain. The ventricles, like I said, are filled with cerebral spinal fluid. And if you take frequency, frequency vibrates within water. And I've got a couple of videos, but as far as being able to show you, um, I, this got copyright, so I can't show that to you. But you can go online and look in, in YouTube and Google the word uh, cymatics. And cymatics will show you really cool stuff related to how sound changes the shape of like sand or water and you know we talk about sacred geometry it's a huge buzzword in the new age movement and basically if you if you take away the basics and bring it down to um, what that word means sacred geometry what's the most sacred thing in all in all of existence it's life and geometry means shape so basically sacred geometry means the shape of life and that shape can be altered, especially wherever there is water and frequency. And each one of our emotions carries a different frequency, activates a different hormone. 
And by getting in touch with our tuner, our um, limbic brain, we can tune ourselves, tune our water, and tune our experiences to have very specific um, positive experiences as opposed to kind of defaulting to negativity. Some of the most uh, popular uh, sacred geometry here is the Star of David, which is really a 2D representation of something more in depth, which is the Merkaba. And the Merkaba is supposed to be a 3D Star of David that surrounds our energy field. Um, here's Rodin's Vortex Mathematics, really interesting stuff. I recommend you YouTube that. Again, that's Rodin's Vortex Mathematics. He gets into toroidal fields, which is basically the shape of a black hole. Um, kind of the same inf information that Nassim's getting into, but from a different perspective. And I thought it was interesting with Rodin's uh, vortex mathematics, it looks a lot like the Freemason symbol, right? You've got the square and the compass coming down. And actually, if you draw a line across these two, it's another Star of David. And even in the center of this Freemason symbol that he got a G, the G spot, the God spot in the center, just like the center of this um, Merkaba, or Star of David around us, is the heart. And that energy is how we directly tie into God. Uh, really interesting stuff. So basically sacred geometry, you could look at the structures, but to me the structures are supposed to be trying to represent something. And basically it represents frequency. So the Star of David, represents a very specific frequency that when you vibrate at that frequency and certain hormones are released then then you tune into higher aspects of reality do you tune into more of your god power and so basically um, sacred geometry is the shape of life and the ventricles which are associated to me with the eye of Horus since it is it just makes sense you got eye of Horus which is he's got a bird head and if you look at the eye of Horus, how it overlays the bird brain, it's like a total tie-in. It's like a clue. So now I'm going to show you here a more representation of Horus. So the limbic brain, the midbrain, is the bird brain and actually is Horus, the, the sun god. And the thalamus, remember, relates to the sun, which is the ego in your astrology chart. So here this hidden information all along saying, hey, this sun god, which is actually an aspect of ourself, is inside your bird brain. That sun is in the center of your head. And if you can access and open that, that's what enlightenment's about. When you start opening these higher aspects of the mind, light just fills the inside of your brain, illuminates your energy, opens your meridians and aligns your chakras even further and you have more and more God power, healing power coming through you, love, all of all the above. Uh, one thing, um, I've studied Reiki for a long time and I did a painting of the symbol Seheiki and I had that painting hanging next to an acupuncture chart in my treatment room and since, you know, when you tune into things and you're focused on things then you, you see them a lot more. So like if you have a red Camaro, you see re red Camaros a lot more. Anyway, I had this uh, painting of the Seiheiki hanging next to my acupuncture chart and I noticed a similarity between how the Seiheiki moves and how the gallbladder meridian, which is right over the limbic bird brain, looks a lot like the Seiheiki. You even have the V and the 5. V, 5, and then the stroke. I was like, wow, that's pretty amazing because the, I've gone through Reiki five different times, five different masters, and hadn't heard any of this information before. But I had heard that the Seiheiki is a color associated with Seiheiki is purple, which would perfectly tie into the third eye. So that's another validation of where that really was. So to me, Yasui was actually mixing in a little bit of acupuncture um, with his teaching and his symbols. Just interesting stuff. So the limbic brain is where the god Horus or the god Ra resides and we have that power within us <clears throat> and one thing I'm being drawn by spirit to do more and more is not to go out my outside myself and seek these entities it's to start going inside myself and an awakening those powers within myself so that the world can be a better place I can be aligned to that god self that we all are a part of and ultimately you know in biblical terms, we were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And I don't think we were kicked out by God. 
But our newfound judgments, eating from the tree of good and bad, which means, you know, entails judgment, when we judge, we are unable to see that we live on the Garden of Eden. Because the Garden of Eden isn't some place on the planet, it's the entire planet. And what happened, what we lost through that process was a continual knowing connection to God and to spirit. It was always there. I mean, Adam and Eve hung around with God and chit-chatted and, and all that types of things. But once they ate from that uh, tree of judgment, they were kicked out of the garden. They were unable to perceive God and the beauty of where they really were. And as we tie back into these higher aspects of our mind, we get more and more into what they call a constant state. And a constant state means that, you know, when meditation kind of puts you into this groovy, blissful feeling, but, you know, when, after the meditation, you kind of come back down. A constant state means that you are solidified at that level. In other words, ultimately, we are going back to reawakening, because we are the fallen ones, when we have to admit it, that we did fall from a particular higher vibration, and now we're working to get ourselves back in a proper relationship with spirit. And once we do that, once we open these higher aspects of our mind, which are our higher chakras, which still need to be balanced to the lower, we don't abandon the lower, <clears throat> like sexuality and creality, creativity is still a viable and important part of us. But as we open these parts to our mind, we, we get more and more continual, uh, aware connection to spirit and God. Pretty interesting, cool stuff. Here's some more symbolism that I found extremely interesting. And this page here is entitled Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, just to play on words here. See this little Egyptian hieroglyph? You've got the beetle, you've got the two wings, then you have the sun disk. Um, the beetle is associated with the solar god uh, Kafir. I probably said that wrong, or Kapir. And basically, the beetle is supposed to push the sun through the sky, much like a dung beetle rolls up dung with their uh, larvae inside. But Again, it's representing something inside of us. Remember I said the wings are the corpus callosum? And look here. Here are the two. We have two thalamuses inside your head. But look at the thalamus. It's got a very distinct segmentation in it. Can you see that? You've got a line down the middle and then a V at top. Well, that's exactly what that is right there. So base, And it's the shape of a beetle. So these two beetles side by side are what the scarab is referring to. And it's right these are right below where the corpus callosum goes through and connects the left and right brain. That's awesome to me. Here you've got another picture, um, actually of a, a jewel. And on the underneath of the scarab, you have two snakes, which represents that two kundalini channels that spiral up through the, through the chakra system and up through the body and awaken and bring light into the head. So these two beetles are associated with the sun god Ra, because the thalamus is Ra. And here we have the beetle pushing the little sun disk. Really amazing. Then you have two more stakes, snakes on the side of the sun disk. Again, the Ida and the Pingali, which are these little snake channels up the medical staff. So here you have the chakra system, the two intertwining um, nadis, which are um, energy channels, the Ida which is on the left is feminine, Pingala on the right, which is masculine. They crisscross the Shashuman, which is that straight channel up, and then at the top, once it's fully awakened, the corpus callosum, the wings, mean a completely balanced left and right brain. 